Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, in an ever so slightly delayed show, we have an ever so slightly brilliant guest, Dr. Amber J. Seppi. I first encountered Dr. Seppi's work in Damned Facts, which is a Charles Fort-inspired collection of essays by academics who are exploring or confronting the broadly Fortian, edited by another previous guest, Dr. Jack Hunter. Amber is a New Zealand-based academic toiling in the triple vineyards of decolonization, indigenous lifeways, and Fortiana, right in our wheelhouse, which also apparently has vineyards in it. Enjoy. Dr. Seppi, I presume. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Gordon. All right. Well, I'm really looking forward to this. We've been chatting backwards and forwards a little bit over the last couple of months, and the premium members have had a look at some of your, well, uh, an article and your PhD. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to having this chat. But before we begin, you have to, uh, you have to answer the traditional first question, Amber, which is, were you a weird <laughs> kid? Uh, one might say, growing up opposite a library, yes, that was my play space. So, yeah, no brothers and sisters, a library across the road, eight adults, definitely a weird kid. Uh, I was the one who was sitting next to the sports field with the book. Um, so, yeah, I play well with others now, though. I've... I've to have reintegrated into society. Yeah. So, I mean, let's go back to that. What were the what were the books? I mean, was it just were you omnivorous in your young reading, or were there particular things in the library that um, caught your eye and and sort of sparked some further obsessions? Um, mostly, it was anything supernatural, like uh, missing boats, frogs falling from the sky. Uh, I was there. Um, ancient history. So all of those wonderful picture books on, you know, ancient Romans and Greeks and Egyptians and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I was not. I, I was not much of a science kid. I was definitely, definitely interested in fantasy, or what was called fantasy, which I'm now questioning really whether it is fantasy. Um, but yeah, um, I really, I kind of embraced a mystical world, if you like, from when I was very young, and I found quite a mismatch between what I thought should be happening, given the books I was reading, and what appeared to be happening in the world. So it was always that kind of disjunct between, hey, I, I think this is a more magical universe than we're allowing for. Yes. Yeah, so when you say fantasy there, you mean books that um, describe things that aren't officially allowed to exist. So in that kind of esoteric and high strange world, rather than, say, the category of fiction we call fantasy, or was it both? Uh, no, the first, the first uh, articulation of it that you had there. I'm... Still not really a fiction reader, even now. I I struggle with that. I'm definitely a big consumer of the occasional fantasy film, but um, not really big on fiction. I was really interested. You know those old sort of Reader's Digest books of the mysteries of the world, um, where you would see all of these uh, kind of Fortean ideas, little excerpts from history, um, the disappearance of is it the Mary Celeste, things like that. So it was definitely um, that kind of that kind of thing that caught my eye. 
um, ancient civilization. Yeah. Why do you need fantasy? Sorry? Why do you need fantasy when the world is uh, yeah. as it is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's some book learning, so, yeah, right? That- um, did you, because, I mean, we're obviously going to talk about your career and research and so on, but were there experiences in your childhood that aligned to, I mean, did you live in a haunted house, etc.? Were there experiences in your childhood that in some sense broadly matched the stuff you were interested in, or was it more a kind of total feeling that the universe is magical, right? Uh, and that was reflected in the book. So were there specific kind of encounters or strange things that happened that, um, you know, maybe made you, maybe gave you that, what's the word, that inner permanent knowing that um, reality is described is in fact poorly described? Well, there was certainly not a haunted house sort of experience uh, to speak of, but I would probably would probably say looking back that um, I've always had extremely heightened intuitive faculties. So, for instance, I've always had um, premonitions and dreams, which um, I could never quite get a good explanation for. Um, I've always been very aware of what other people were thinking but not necessarily saying. Um, I used to I used to be able to find either people or pieces of information that I was looking for. Um, for example, I was at one point, I have a, a half-brother who was in a difficult situation and I needed to find him. So I knew what basic suburb he was in and I drove over to the suburb and I drove around until I felt him and found him and walked up the driveway to the house that he was in. So those sort of experiences have been a normal part of my life, actually sort of tuning in to um, certain things that might be considered by others to be unexplainable or difficult to put into words. So, yeah, I guess I always have had a sense that there was there was more to what was going on and I've always also had a sense of assistance, if you like, from the universe at large, to put it in the simplest terms that I can come up with. Sure. Um, on a show like this, you can put it in specific terms, if you like. Um, that I'm sure people are hanging on uh, on every word. Um, so, was it sort of off to the races for you once you found those kind of books? Was there, like, did you think, I'm actually going to make a career or research path out of this when I hit adulthood? Or, or did um, did Teenage Amber want to be a fireman or something somewhere in the middle there? Or was it kind of like once you found it, this sort of world, this discourse, this research, was it home for you and that's what you were always going to do? Uh, no. <laughs> I'd like to say it was that simple. No, not at all. Um, Teenage Amber went into uh, childcare looking after other people's children and um, then into the food industry and then into some driving jobs and some office jobs and some time in Australia and some various other kind of wanderings. Um, I think it would be safe to say that the, the those kind of openings, I mean, this is a broader philosophical point, but those kind of openings that um, you might have connection to when you're a child... Um, are sometimes difficult for people, or it would seem, not just for me, difficult to actually then integrate into sort of a, a life because we're pushed in particular sorts of directions. And I would also say that those kind of openings are enhanced by a lot of negative um a lot of negative childhood experiences, um, which I, I won't go into, but they seem to be double-loaded. For example, you'll have um, psychics, for instance, who also struggle with dyslexia and alcoholism and have difficult childhoods. Those sort of things seem to go together, like the conditions of your life push you in that direction. But then, of course, you have to take time out to deal with the conditions of your life. Mm. Uh, or you can actually align with what might have been highlighted 
or you in childhood and what might actually prove to be the reason for your survival of difficult circumstances. Yeah. And that was certainly true for me. So there was a lot to process between then and eventually um, returning to school, which I didn't do until I was 32. You know, that time in between was difficult, you know. Sure. Um, one, one might say that you've got to kind of take the time to be a match for what it is that you really feel compelled to do and also have the confidence to say, well, yeah, you know, I can actually be a weird adult and I can actually pursue this um, and I can make a life from it and I can study it and use it for something, which is not something I believed could happen until relatively late in the process. Um, the whole idea of going to university, you think, well, what can I do? I want to study all of these odd things. Well, that's not going to make a career. And you generally, generally believe that. Um, but, of course, you could, for me anyway, to get out of that idea that what you do has to lead to something that's immediately obvious when you begin, is there's a leap of faith there. And you could get out of that sort of thinking that, well, no, I don't have to have it all planned out. I'll walk in this direction and I'll see... I'll see whether the universe joins me into turning this into something that is actually going to also feed me and so on and so forth. So, yeah, the process has been very much like that for me. Well, it, that's also a lesson one from, uh, you know, years of wandering, right? I mean, I didn't turn pro weird until early 30s either. And it's, there is the, it's, it's hard. Like, it, it's hard to get out of your head and the, oh, well, you need to have a proper job. And you get told this as a kid and you've told it for the right reasons in the sense that, the people in your life, parents or whoever, who are concerned for your future, w want to make sure <laughs> that, uh, you know, it, it turns out in an approximately safe way because that's their job. But yeah, absolutely. I, um, I resonate with that. I wanted to uh, pick back up the sort of the match between, say, childhood uh, trauma experiences and subsequent psych capacities, because that is very problematic term, though it is uh, broadly shamanic. Um, in its formulation. So there is some kind of, for whatever reason, uh, extreme or unpleasant events can, or, or at least then overlap more than people realize with subsequent strangeness to the point where it appears to potentially have been used in various Cold War projects to try and um, see what we can do with psychic spies versus the Russians and, and so on. So it's, uh, it, I think... Uh, Ah, yeah. Yes. So I think, um, and weirdly, this is where I wanted to begin the um, the meat of the discussion because you first came to my attention in now also Dr. Jack Hunter's book Damn Facts with an amazing essay at the back of it. And one of the things that has haunted me since I read it is um, you have this quotation, and I should, probably should have pulled it out so I can read it exactly, but that. Your observation was it's probably quite important that the majority of cultures on Earth, so excluding, say, Enlightenment European cultures, right, um, have mm -hmm. considerable similarities with each other when it comes to thinking with the more than human and psi and so on, and that these considerable similarities overlap themselves with the last 120 or so years of psi research. So there's a very good comparative observation there that allows us to, I would say, kind of like look backwards at our inherited ideological shortcomings and go, well, maybe we can head in this direction. And I just wondered if you wanted to... Uh, um, expand on that because I loved it. I think I think I've used that pool quote in uh, a presentation in Sydney last year as well. So, um, what was, I mean, talk us through that. Was that was that something you vaguely knew as you were heading into research, or is it when you sort of moved into anthropology, you're kind of looking at some what appeared to be structural, another problematic term, similarities uh, across cultures that are probably less messed up when it comes to thinking with these ideas. So in order to answer that question, um, it's probably good to to consider that in, a, in the academic context that I went into, there is a, 
a need to compartmentalise and classify things using particular frameworks. So there's lots of there's lots of workarounds that are used to do that. Um, for example, phenomenology. Phenomenology um, is really looking at certain kinds of things using a lens which allows it to be cleaned up. Um, there are a number of these. I've probably got I've collected a list of about of about fifty of these ways that the Westernised people like to talk about what we would call um, psych phenomenon or intuitive phenomenon in a way that that makes it appear less less mystical, less magical, and so forth. And um, a real resistance against, as I think I also mentioned in damn facts, against um, allowing people's uh, experiences with non-physical to stand as they are. Um, I think I gave an example of you know, the elderly lady on the corner who's busy having a cup of coffee in the morning with her dead husband. She's considered, whereas uh, you'll find in anthropological research, you'll find a lot of um, discussion of you know, venerating the ancestors and so on and so forth. And there's a whole lot of non-physical interaction that's going on there, but it's called culture and it's called religion. And it's made into something that's that's allowed to exist within an academic context, but not actually taken seriously outside of that. Now, basically, the, the old lady having a coffee with her dead husband and the conversation with an ancestor in a context which contributes to the overall health of the community in an indigenous context, it's the same thing. But we've said, well, that's okay for those people because that's culture. But over here, no, we don't do that sort of thing. That's rubbish. And I was really, I really had a trouble with that because a lot of the content that's presented, and especially in the discipline of anthropology, which I eventually left, is presented in a way that kind of forces a reduction. And what uh, what happened in the course of the the years that I've been um, studying was that I actually decided to take that problem head on, which became the content of my um, doctoral research, and really think about what we can do to recognise that these are these are human experiences. These are universal human experiences. Culture, religion, irrelevant. This is what humans experience in what is a universe full of sentient expressions. Now, that was considered a very radical path to go down from an academic perspective. But we're we're kind of being forced to go in that direction in order to recover a sense of our humanity and a sense of our real sort of understanding of, of what a human is good for, what a human is made for, how a human operates, how critical their uh, intuitive faculties are to our well-being. Um, there's a great quote by a woman called um, Louisa Tisch, and she says that while other, other animals have got claws and fangs and all of this, and survive. Humans don't have any of those things. Humans are incredibly vulnerable. But what we do have, if we allow it to develop, are these capacities, these intuitive and instinctual capacities that connect us to the rest of the species, plants, wider environment that connect us to each other and allow us to actually function in a way in the world that brings our creativity into collaborative harmony with other other beings. Mm. And by other beings, I mean other species and other humans and other, um, perhaps, ancestral aspects of consciousness that we have constant access to. Now, you put that in an academic forum and you immediately say, well, that's religious studies. I'm like, no, no this is not religious studies. This is the great missing chunk of human studies, <laughs> this is the bit that systems ecology is trying to get at. This is the part that um, is absolutely critical for our understanding of 
who and what we are. And if you start looking at the different systems of thought that have been developed over long-term um, process, for example, um, Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine and Chinese understandings of the human functioning, though it has been systematically um, mapped over a very long period of time, integrates an understanding of the human in energetic terms, in physical terms, in the, the sort of tangible what we eat, how we live, whether we exercise terms, but also the relationship between the parts which comes together when a human is having um, an experience in community and in place which is health granting. And the basis of human um, flourishing for that system of thought is that the doctor is in, in charge of making sure you stay well, not curing you from an illness if you're sick. Not that I think Western, westernised medical thinking actually cures much, but it's a whole other philosophy. It's maintaining those relationships that you have within the, within the body, between the organs in the body, between the individual and their family, the individual in an emplaced environment within a community. All of those relationships are, to a very high level, codified in the whole system of thought that underpins Chinese medicine. And it's such a good example, Amber, because uh, if you, it's a good example of what you were talking about when you say that uh, the content of Chinese medicine, if we try to engage it in a Western academic mode, has to be either reduced or reductionized is almost a really good word to to describe it. So that they, we go looking for the the molecules within a an herbal remedy that would have an approved. Um, chemical impact on the human body, and maybe that's it. And we and we kind of see the same thing when pharma companies go looking in the Amazon. They're looking for molecules, mm -hmm. and uh, and because that's allowed to work. But by the same token, what I find fascinating about the kind of cutting edge of Western health studies is so they're doing that on one hand, and then on the other hand, they're aware that a more coherent approach to life, right? The, the research behind mindfulness meditation, regular attendance at church, temple, or mosque all these kind of pieces that have a net uplift in health and a dramatic reduction in, in Western diseases, such as heart disease and depression and so on. So they have this kind of stumbling towards coherence on one end, but the, the, the other systems or modes of thought that may be inspirational to us are only allowed in, in a, as you say, there's, we, we have these sort of clunky workarounds to port in um, sources of, 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 knowledge, um, and even describing it that way is gross, but sources of knowledge or, or other ways of being in life. And we just, they don't, they don't click together. And it's almost like, I've used this metaphor before. It's like if you're bringing up artifacts from a shipwreck and you can see them coming up with the divers um, from the boat. And, and as soon as they hit the air, because they've been underwater, they sort of rust and crumble to dust. And that to me is kind of like, where we are in a Western academic mode in trying to live with or be enriched by new ideas. But I just, I love that Chinese medicine example. I think it's so good. I completely agree with you. They're, they're, they're bringing things up and watching them turn to dust in front of you is, is so fitting. The, the, the part that I've eventually stumbled on and I'm not going to take credit for this, even though it appears in one's head, it doesn't necessarily mean it belongs to you, um, is that what I think is happening is we've got, we've got this leftover theological content that has become a purified, secular, Western, modern way of thinking. And, and you, you, the academy is the perfect place for observing this in action, but it's not just a matter of bringing in a scientific method. It's much older than that. It's a way of thinking the world that requires that reduction in order to fit it into the cosmological frame. And I can see that 
at the very heart of our scientific inquiry, but also at the very heart of our socialisation processes. I mean, the requirement, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you encourage when you're growing up to pursue a certain path and do certain things and avoid the weird. You're avoiding the weird because the weird is dangerous. And the weird is dangerous because of a particular kind of religious thinking that we're barely aware of, that it's right here with the heart of westernised thinking. And that, that notion that there is danger there, you know, here be dragons, that is very old thinking. And we, we are beholden to it for as long as we do not interrogate it and actually reveal it for what it is. I mean, if you, if you, and I have done this experiment in the classroom, if you actually ask people, are you religious? No, no, no. A lot of people will answer, no, I'm not particularly religious. And then you bring up certain topics, such as the ones that I know you are interested in and you've seen through my work and so forth that I'm interested in looking at. Those topics are immediately met with a fear reaction. Like, this is dangerous to the group. We can't be indulging this. It's a very primal sort of reaction. But the mechanisms of, of being socialised into that and then the reinforcements that are in a, a typical sort of modernised, westernised society, even independently of whatever cultural foundations might also be co-present, very, very strong. And I'm, I'm now sort of setting my target, if you like, to really exposing that because it's not a lived Christianity that's there. It's a, it's a different thing. It's an it's a old way of sorting the universal contents that is saying, well, this is good and this is bad and this is evil yeah. and this will interfere with salvation. It's, it's a crypto-medieval Christianity. Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps, perhaps it even goes back before then. I mean, there's a there's a lot of a lot of places in ancient history you can see this kind of thinking. Um, sure. I think I think Christianity has a prehistory right there, but it's not it's not like a lived Christian faith. That, that, well, that's that the funny thing now. about it, right? Because if you there's some really good expressions of of a living universe in medieval Christianity, particularly the mystics. You've got Hildegard of Bingen is is probably my favorite example. Her or um, St Francis and St Clare. Like you actually have people who and oh, well, Hildegard was kind of rich. Um, but if you look at Francis and Clare in particular, they're otherized and weird and dangerous and until you know until sanctified but here they are the thing is if you don't as you say if you don't look at it um you only get the bad bits <laughs> absolutely absolutely and when you do look at it it seems almost ridiculous you think well okay um yeah i i don't need to be beholden to that way of thinking um and i've i've done this in a classroom i've um taken a group of 25 students through this process um, and done uh, done something which I've come to call worldview analysis or cosmological interrogation, which actually teaches the history of Western thinking, Westernized thinking, from and, and exposes those stories. And then uh, I've asked them to actually take a regular practice like um, vaccinating one's children. Uh, taking uh, dieting, just very, very simple um, things that you might not even think about and actually go back and find the charter myths or the origin stories or the cosmological origins of those practices. Say, well, what are the stories that set the fact value weighting within this practice in a particular way that we say this is good or this is bad this has value or this doesn't this kind of knowledge about this particular activity has value as against that kind of knowledge and it's a way of deconstructing what shows up in one might say sort of socially normative actions um, that are sanctioned by a whole community of people who, who may surround us and saying well, actually, these, these, our, our choice of this particular activity comes from 
a set of ideas about the nature of the universe. You can take it right back to that point. Um, one example that um, I found really effective, uh, you might recall, just to, to, to take a celebrity, you might recall the uh, media frenzy around Angelina Jolie having the... Um, was it double or a single mastectomy? Double. Was it double. Yeah. For the as a response to um, her belief that she had a particular cancer gene, and she'd lost her mother, and so on and so forth. So I had I had a class of students actually really look at that and say, "All right, well, what's the media?" Now there were there were all kinds of opinions, but they were largely around what a good mother, what a saviour, what a hero. Um, she's doing this particular action for the sake of her children, so on and so forth. And the, the trick in a classroom situation was to say, okay, well, without judging this in one way or another, find the, the actual uh, processes by which this particular action, which in a different cultural context might be presented in the same way as something like, say, female circumcision, you know, is seen as perfectly okay. I mean, she had a double mastectomy. It's fairly brutal. How was this constructed as a really good thing? And they went through the process. They found the, the different cosmological stories from, from religion. They found the stories from science. They managed to identify the what I call ontological objects that are set by the origin stories. So cancer gene, for example, that would be an ontological object. Belief in there being a cancer gene extends from particular ideas that come from scientific origin stories. Genes, atoms, these things are the objects that exist by which the world of, is made to make sense uh, according to a particular story. And having taken them through this process, um, we were then able to go and look at other practices in totally different, one might say radically different cultural contexts, and go looking for the same stories that make them make sense. So it was a, the, the, whole, the whole thing which I've, I've come to now be advocating for quite strongly is a matter of deconstructing what we take to be unquestionable truth by going and finding the pieces by which that particular view of the universe is constructed. Mm. And the example with Jolie was very effective just simply because it, it's not viewed as barbaric. You know, that's viewed as... That's viewed by a large group of people as being possibly a good thing that um, she chose to do. So, um, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, and I really love how you're kind of characterizing that you're about sort of following the storylines back because uh, just coming to more than stories, which is a piece that people will find in the show notes um, listening to this that you wrote, I kind of have this, we're talking about the gradual or the development of that reductionizing impulse in broadly Western thought over a couple of millennia. Like, as you say, the Christians inherited their squeamishness about magic from the Romans, and, and we obviously have the kind of um, Greek-inspired Neoplatonism. So there's a lot of uh, – the dissociation was sort of baked in from the beginning in, in a lot of respects. Uh, but yeah. there is – it kind of – there's this line that Hemingway wrote, um, which is sort of, how did you go bankrupt? Slowly at first, then all at once. <laughs> and it's very it's him, but it's also, there's a moment in that slowly at first uh, reductionizing bankruptcy where it becomes all at once. And there, it, it is that kind of tip into uh, Cartesian materialism, right? So we were sort of not very good at, uh, you know, that kind of coherent thinking for 1,600 years, actually more like 2,100. Uh, and then we hit the Enlightenment. Uh, and then we got really bad at it. Then we got the all at once moment in, in many respects when you look at the, the intervening 300 years uh, and, and what that's kind of done to 
the planet and our ways of being and and you know <laughs> the rise of global slave trades and and all the rest of it that can that, that is associated with this way of thinking and mm-hmm. uh so in the article i just referenced so more than stories more than myths uh I'm going to turn that into a question. I, I presume you agree that there's, it's a kind of like slowly at first, all at once, because you, you're very interested, and rightly so, in a decolonizing process. Absolutely. So, so why do we all need to, dis- to decolonize, and, uh, and what does that look like? So m- maybe even just describe colonization, and then – because I think – there are there prior to the Enlightenment, there could have been um, mystic, and there still are. But like the to resacralize the universe was a mystic and in some sense individual process. But since three hundred ish years ago, it is still that, and it is also more than that. So talk us through how you conceptualize colonization and and what does decolonizing look like. Well, firstly. Um it's a very good question. It's firstly, it's really important to make a clear difference between colonialism and colonisation, and this is uh, perhaps pushing at the boundaries. Um, those who are familiar with any kind of indigenous scholarship, colonialism is a particular process which I'm sure we're all somewhat familiar with that has about a 500 year history, and it's a process of actually dis- disembedding people from place in often very violent ways that has landed on a particular group of people. Now, colonialism, in my way of thinking that I outline in that article and, and subsequently in the thesis, which will hopefully at some point be a book, is the last part or the most recent part of what I consider a very, very long-term process of colonisation, which to some degree affects everybody. Now, it's important to make the distinction because the two terms quite often get confused with one another. And so you can't really talk about decolonisation without first making that distinction. Where I am coming from is in line with a very small handful of Indigenous academics. Dwayne Donald is one of them. He's um, a Canadian academic. Um, Moana Jackson, who's a New Zealand Māori academic. Um, There are a few others. But what they're really saying is that colonisation has a very long history. And that history involves systematically disembedding people from places and traditions over a long period of time so that the process itself becomes forgotten. Um, So we really end up in a state of amnesia. Now, the link here to to colonial processes is important because my contention is that Indigenous people have a living memory of this process. They remember in broad terms what happened and how it was done. And have tried to hold on to some of what was uh, attempted to be eradicated. So they have an understanding in, in most, if not, not all cases, but in most cases they have an understanding of what that experience of loss involves. Now the difference between that and what for westernised peoples have is that westernised peoples tend to have absolutely no idea that there might be another way of functioning. There might be hints of it. We might feel like, oh, there's something not quite right. But the the full weight of what has been lost over a long period of time through very similar processes to what was experienced with colonialism is really outside of memory. And there's really... It's very difficult to um, to suggest that at one point everyone's ancestors were living in place in deep relationship with particular places, with other species, with each other in an entirely different manner. But I mean, it, when when you think about it, it's completely logical because obviously we didn't always live like this, and we've all 
clearly got ancestors. And at some point, whether by force or by choice, those ancestors became a part of this process, which has now appears as normal, as dysfunctional, normal. So when I say, I think a, a extremely um, deep decolonization is required, what I'm suggesting is that we look very closely at what we call westernised normality and we interrogate that for what is functional versus dysfunctional and that we look very closely at what aspects of that lean towards what I would call blood thinking, so war, violence, destruction, um, self-interest above cooperation, over and above what things in that might actually be repurposed to be sustainable. So, and, and to actually, when I say sustainable, I mean in the sense of um, sustaining healthy communities, sustaining human well-being, flourishing, um, not being um, immediately destructive to the environment and the, the other species that surround us. So saying decolonise everything is really, let's look, saying, let's look really closely at what these stories we've been talking about have left us with and let's reference and speak to those who have a memory of this process and can actually articulate what it is like to live properly as a human on the planet and say, well, what do you think? And that's what my thesis work was about. So I spent seven years actually gathering elder wisdom on from a, a, largely North America Canada, simply because they have a, a more comprehensive body of knowledge um, that's coordinated than is found in a lot of other places, but also looking at Australia and a few other places and actually saying, well, what do you think? What do you think happened to us and what should we do about it? And what was really interesting is that since at least the 1970s, the elders from different indigenous traditions have really been saying the same thing. Saying, okay, you Western people have forgotten who you are. You've lost your circle. You've um, forgotten what it is to live well. This process that happened to us also happened to you. You just don't remember it. And you need to re indigenize to place, which doesn't mean become indigenous in the sense that it, it links politically to rights and resources and identity and colonialism, it means reconnect to particular places using the principles that have been preserved in traditional and indigenous ecological thinking. And that means relationship, respect, reciprocity, uh, reverence, the principles of redistribution, sharing. It, it means a understanding for what the human is, their intuitive capacities, for raising people, interacting with each other according to right relations, and really returning to what in North America and Canada are called original instructions. Mm. See, so I, yeah, it's possibly already that's answered. That's what decolonizing means. <laughs> I love it, love it. Big round of applause. Uh, it's possibly already answered my next question with when you said asking them what do you think happened to us because I think that's a really uh, really good way of inviting that information in a way that we can absorb it and in a way that it can be conveyed in, in, in as clean as possible a mode but and you address this a little bit in the article but we'll, we'll bring it up now in an almost devil's advocate perspective uh, how do we – one of the criticisms is – well, one of the shallow criticisms could be some sort of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, noble savage um, idealism of these indigenous wisdom teachers having something to give us and, uh, because we've fallen from a, um, yeah, a, a Rousseauian state, right? So how do we do comparison and explore difference – 
when it comes to cross-cultural exploration and engagement like this. So one of the, I did actually write this, this quotation down uh, from your good self in that article that's below the uh, episode. I argue with indigenous and traditional peoples for the recognition of an enduring continuity of human experience experience across time, geographies, cultures, and traditions. Now, this is music to my ears, because one of the unthinking criticisms of comparison, I, I, I have Dr. Kripal, Dr. Jeff Kripal on the show um, a number of times, big fan, and he's like one of the kings of comparison in a, in a religious uh, perspective, is um, we need to stop the sort of knee-jerk 101 post-structuralist. I'm, I like post-structuralism, but we need to stop that 101 relativization um, and mm. so how do we w- – there's a tension point there, which I, I want to talk about, between there is information in embedded in indigenous life ways that is probably urgently um, required even as a source of inspiration or, or re-inspiriting of our own life ways. How do we have that discussion and comparison in the best way. Do you know it's actually quite difficult? So, so what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, it is quite difficult. I um, I had to go through all of these tropes for the for the academic long winded process of putting this into a thesis. And the one of the issues is that the tropes, whilst the the, the idea of the noble savage you mentioned, um, or the savage primitive, or the ecological Indian, whilst these ideas have been um, picked up. They were picked up in a particular, or the resistance to them was picked up in a particular context which was a time in which the the racialization and the cultural evolutionary um, slant that ethnographers had been taking was being queried. Now the critique of certain lines of scholarship for um, constructing a noble savage was valid. However, the idea of the ecological Indian, for example, pulled in with that. And the idea that, that traditional and indigenous ecologically oriented peoples are in some ways separate from environment appears ridiculous that they will say we are the environment. So you have a disjunct there between a scholarly reaction to certain kinds of scholarship and the way in which indigenous, traditional, ecologically oriented peoples present themselves. So you've got a little dance going on in the academy over this particular uh, mode of representation. But the dance is between academics. It doesn't really have a lot to do with the people on the ground stating the case in their own words as to who they are and what they do. So that's one part of the question that you asked. The other, with regard to comparison, is that comparison was also uh, victim of a similar dance in academic circles because of the proclivity of um, certain types of academics in a historical context to line everything up, compare it with one another, and then draw a conclusion, often from an armchair. So you're looking at the likes of, say, James Fraser, the Golden Bow. You, you've got a particular way of doing things which has in the shift towards more and more particularised ethnographic exploration um, become put to one side as we know we don't do comparison or only religious scholars will do comparison. Once again, he's throwing the baby out with the bathwater mm. because in actual Indigenous scholarship, Indigenous academics and those whom they speak to in their own communities and in other communities will, without question, draw parallels between what they do and other Indigenous groups. So even though I think the various um, adjustments that have been made by academics themselves, in particular academic departments over time, have been necessary, they are a part of a much bigger process and there is um, definitely reason now to look at them again and say, all right, there's several things that we've been attached to here 
do this, don't do that, et cetera, et cetera. And those are two very good examples that you raised that don't actually serve the communities that um, we ought to be um, giving our support to in uplifting the kinds of not just wisdom, but also uh, the political aspirations that um, might be important in the securement of rights and resources for those who are still suffering under colonialist conditions because colonialism really isn't over as long as no. people are living in reservations. No. It's not over. No, it's not. You know? Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I think this is, this is the other part other than just asking, which you just hit on there, is what could be more decolonizing and decolonializing than allowing the... Uh, allowing Indigenous epistemologies to kind of stand on their own feet. If they're doing comparison, if they recognise the continuity, the enduring continuity of human experience that you mentioned, if if we are all humans, uh, mm-hmm. at le- let's see what sort of ontol- let let's um, make space or um, listen to the ontologies that emerge from that process. I don't know if you know Marcus Modafferi Lloyd, another, I think I've had more Kiwis on than Australians, which um, reflects my bias. Uh, but he was at Standing Rock. He's a water activist in the North Island, but he was at Standing Rock. And um, and that enduring continuity of human experience, especially with um, with reference to colonialism, is is in full show there. So as you say, it is a, it is a dance between academics. Um, and And it seems like one, asking what do you think happened to us, and two, allowing that um, those ontologies to emerge in, in 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 specifically indigenous ways, rather than having them turn to Manage. dust. Yeah, rather than having them turn to dust as they land in in a Western discourse, that seems to be seems to be two very good steps. Yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely it. Um, my my thesis work has been doing that. Very thing. But actually, looking at, at that academic engagement and saying, right, well, this clearly isn't working, and the the information that is there that elders have actually been really pushing to get out into the world to actually ta- to actually help to say, listen, you got it wrong. We we know what's going on here. We know what to do. This is what you need to do and actually be heard. It's, that's just been covered over by a lot of dancing around how to properly do ethnography or, yeah. or how, to be, um, how to be respectful. Well, the answer is very easy. To be respectful, be respectful. Yeah. Here's what they said. Here's how they said it. Don't interpret it. <laughs> yeah, and and like and the engagement piece. I don't know if you've read. It's remarkable. Um, uh, Dr. Marsha Langton is a Indigenous Australian scholar based in Melbourne, and she's written the first uh, Indigenous Australian guidebook, like travel guide, welcome to country. So you uh-huh. can. It, it is a book of of explicitly Aboriginal places and businesses. So theoretically, and it's a sort of remarkable performance project in this way. In theory, you can land at Sydney with this book and kind of like never visit Australia. Uh, and she was being interviewed on the ABC when the book came out. I think it came out in about May. And they, they were talking about a business that's uh, in North Queensland and, and the women there kind of like make baskets and, and obviously sell the baskets and so on. And she said, people in an, so tourists read white tourists in a, um, in an attempt to be respectful, will just kind of watch and don't engage. And Dr. Langton's like, ask them. Ask them about it. If you're interested in something, what colours they use, how it's weaved or whatever, like that's that's what it's for. Like listen to what it is, listen to what's going on. And it's that kind of, um, we've been colonised. So it's that extended process of denying relationships that Dwayne Donald um, mentions that's in your article. Like there, we need to listen. And, and it's, I, so I was out, I think I mentioned uh, on Anunu Lands in May, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Songlines exhibition that was on in Canberra last year, which was this remarkable Seven Sisters Songline, um, remarkable art exhibition of all the different kind of traditional uh, of art from all along the Seven Sisters Songline in Australia. So all the different peoples who hold a different part of it kind of came together. And this is, as you say, it's a deliberate like this information. Is is here for you to 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 in some to some sense fix you, but also like 
here, have this, listen to us. And, uh, and I think part of the, on the other side of it, so our side of it, it seems to me part of that decolonizing process is to be respectful and also less squeamish. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I have a number of, um, they're quite difficult to find, I might say, but a number of statements from um, different parts of country, Aboriginal, Australian statements of that nature. Um, and what I find most remarkable is Australia has possibly some of the worst conditions mm-hmm. found around the world for Indigenous people and rights and resources and so forth. Uh, they're not even... They're not even approaching where they ought to be. The grace with which these invitations are extended by um, various people from far-reaching parts of Australia to the um, the Australians, the non-Indigenous Australians, to say, despite all this, we're we're not going to hold on to our anger. We want you to heal. We want, we want you to be a part of an Australia that's good for everyone is just testament, just right there, of um, how mindful and respectful we really should be at this moment in history. Because uh, yeah, it it makes me it, cry. It makes uh, like we're doing a magical geography course with the premium members now, and there's a lot of. Um, because I'm on country now, I'm back in Australia, right? So there's a lot of uh, in- Indigenous voices in it. And it makes me cry and want to vomit just the the grace, as you say, because there is probably nowhere in the empire that was as successful at, at genocide <laughs> than here. Yeah. And, and the, the the response backwards um, is it just, I can't. There's a um, one of the quotations that was um, uh, elder woman, I can't remember her name now, Kampaya something, um, Matu people on the Seven Sisters songline. And then she's being interviewed in the book that comes along with the exhibition. And, uh, She's talking about how the Seven Sisters Songline is actually global because it is. It's the, it's the story of the Pleiades. You've got Matariki, for instance, in uh, in New Zealand, and and all across the planet is the story of Pleiades. And two thirds of them are associated with hunting groups chasing women. So this story is at least seventy thousand years old, and she somehow knows this. But it's weird that um, she, when she's talking, white fella, black fella, same Matu. So the empire hit. A collection of civilizations that didn't that was had such a different understanding of difference that the word for tribe is the same as the word for mankind. Like the word for humankind is Matu. And you just ah oh, makes me want to vomit. You just think about the the difference in those ideologies as they clashed. So uh it's I've been away from Australia for fifteen years and it's been remarkable to feel on country the difference when these you know uh Indigenous wisdom keepers are saying this information is coming back and it is here to heal you. I can tell you from a professional perspective, something like that is going on. And uh, and it's really, really intense. It's a really intense experience for people who uh, even have the, the, the dimmest awareness of just the crimes that ha- not only were, but continue to be um, committed or perpetrated against the traditional custodians. So uh, it's, I've just, that, I had to get that out of my chest because you were absolutely right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not just in Australia either. This is um, happening. I mean, I think in hindsight, remember all the fuss around 2012? I think that did happen. Yeah. And now we're, we're in it. Um, and I, I won't go into great detail on that right now, but um, I can tell you as confirmation really that a lot of what, has come into my sphere to to try and be disseminated as widely as possible through this this limited sort of academic channel which I've, I've tried to cut out. Um, a lot of that would not have been accessible uh, even ten years ago if if I've mm-hmm. been trying to actually put this work out there and. Um, it just seems like there's more and more and more all the time. Like we're we're, we're reaching a kind of velocity, to this change which will be forced <laughs> upon the 
be unknown, like it or not. It seems like um, someone, I heard someone the other day call it an indigenous spring, which I thought was That's cool. probably not the yeah, 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 exactly. Like a real, that real sense of, okay, time, time now. Yeah. Like, you know, you know what it is, just to bring us pleasingly back, because I, I agree with you that we're in a new sun. Like, I think 2012 was a thing in some way, shape, or form. But this, because as we come to the end of our discussion, pleasingly brings us back to where I first found you and Charles Fort. This, the dominant yeah. of wider inclusions or the dominant of witchcraft, is the indigenous spring. That was in Charles Fort? Well, no. So his dominant, the one we're kind of heading into, the dominant of wider inclusions, where oh. spirit and, and it's kind of like the eon of weeds, you know, like uh, spirit and restoration and, and, and the end of that structural empiricist. It's not even the end of empiricism, right? Like this process doesn't obliterate empiricism. It redeems it. It, it allows us to Absolutely. use it correctly, you know, and... Yeah. That's exactly what I meant when I was when you asked about decolonization, and I said it's about interrogating what is dysfunctional within Westernization, not actually necessarily throwing out. Uh, this is not this is not a return to a golden age idea. It's not throwing out what um, wisdom keepers from Turtle Island would call the the bounties of the north. It's about repurposing and tweaking and shifting those um, those uh, bounties, if you like, that have come through this period of darkness. Almost it's almost presented as if this, this whole this whole process was, was intentional. It's like we'll throw those people into a dark room and we'll see what they can come up with and we'll pull them out and we'll dust it off and we'll look at what's good and we'll repurpose that and rebuild a new world. It always comes off that way. When yeah. You put it in it, these so um, I, I think there's really, much like the 2012, I think there's something to that. So uh, I have um, Gary Luckman on the show fairly regularly, and he's quite interested in the sort of Ian McGilchrist ideas of... Uh, of and it, it's good to think with this idea as long as you, you realise that you are risking sort of uh, ignoring or whitewashing the actual... Uh, death parade that was the empiricist empire. Uh, it, it's almost like that we had to take this three century diversion into almost satanic delusion, like materialism. I mean, we, we come out of it with, you know, um, such as they are the, the, the technological improvements that come from thinking about the world wrong. And here we are at the point where these things need to. In that speaking of world, that Don Donna Haraway sense, the, they need to participate in subsequent worlding with 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 other voices. It's it's where it it's where it goes next. And I like thinking about that idea, and it's useful, except that you do kind of realize there's a chance you might go, oh well, pity about you know everything that happened on that on that death parade to getting us mobile phones. Yeah, and I think for some people it will always be an oh well, and then perhaps they will at some point be retired and recycled back into the universe and, um, and we can sort of move on from that. For some people, it'll always be an oh well. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a balance point between accepting what has been and feeling that at a very deep level and reckoning with it and bearing witness to it and living in it. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another example there to be taken um, from the, the grace of what I would call the Indigenous invitation. Um, yeah. To actually say it's important that we understand. It's important that we feel that, that, we, that we use the process to switch on a level of empathy and a level of strong understanding of, of the fact that this is a shared human experience yeah. and that your pain and my pain are the same. And the, in an ancestral way, I don't mean in an immediate moment way, that you, you have to really feel it, but then you have to say, right, I get it. Now, what is the best use of the particular interests, the creativity, the talents, the passions, the whatever, 
that I or those who are around me who I am mentoring or teaching, what 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 is what is a, a good use of those things in service to the future generations that are coming? And how will I now take that understanding and push it forwards for the benefit of others, which is, I think, a, a really sort of deep, non-altruistic version of service. We're actually, actually understanding that we're in a sequence here of those that have come before us now and who's coming next. And we're not going to see the end of this process in our lifetimes. We're not going to see... A, a world that is significantly better than the one that we have right now. But we can make one if we appreciate our continuity in terms of our human, shared human experience. So, so, yeah, I hear you. I don't want to erase the, the death song, if you like, that the um, manifestation of that blood strand, as I called it before, the emphasis on war and violence and so on, but but I do I do want to really suggest that we don't linger together in it yeah. too long because that that has its own sort of kind of sucky <laughs> effect where you really do you really can get pulled into it and um, I see that a lot in those that engage or start to engage in a scholarly way with, um, for example, settler guilt, which is particularly relevant for Australia. I think it's a really important thing to think about, and I think it's really important to think in terms of one's ancestry and the relationships to one's ancestry. But I also see some scholars that, that stay Just there it, without yeah. actually reaching their hand over the line and saying, okay, well, my focus should really be, if I'm going to have settler guilt, my focus should really be on the person next to me, yeah. whether they're an immigrant, whether they're Aboriginal, whether they're um, a- another settler like myself, whether it's a child, whether it's an animal, or whatever. Yeah, you know, 100%. What's the next point of looking over the line? Because you... There's, you don't want to erase that. You don't want any, um, what Eve Tuck, who's an Aleut scholar, calls settler most to innocence. But at the same time, this binary, this binary is not something that the elders who I have been paying attention to want to emphasize. No, absolutely. Like, this is, so um, I think I mentioned that I, I lived in, I lived in New Zealand for seven years, right? And I left Howard's Australia in disgust. And one of the reasons I left Howard's Australia in disgust, it was, uh, well, he's racist, but in particular, he's explicitly racist when it came to the whole kind of question of apologizing to uh, Australian Aborigines for just one of the crimes, which was the 70 years in which we took babies from their parents and, and raised them in institutions. And what he missed, and this is that clash, and it just speaks to what you said about the, uh, the indigenous teachers waiting to teach us. What he missed was in an Aboriginal conception, you're talking sorry business is an acknowledgement that really bad things have happened. We all sit together and, and feel the pain that some bad things have happened so that we may move it forward because otherwise mm. it's frozen in time. And he was yeah. looking at it like, well, I didn't steal any kids. You can go fuck yourselves. And he think, God, it's just every level of racist. And it's also, he's colonized. The people who think they shouldn't yeah. apologize because- you know, they it didn't wasn't. explicitly steal <laughs> Aboriginal children from their parents, is missing. It's just this complete, absolute mismatch between here is the actual healing cosmology that will help everyone improve as a, you know, nation or, or collection of peoples or whatever, and they can't hear it because they hear the legal implications of apologizing for a crime. The the statement that you just made with the the idea that he has colonised that concept of ancestry that makes sorry business possible isn't accessible from a colonised mindset, which is going right back to what we've really been touching on all the way through. The idea of the ancestors being present with you here and now in you and the future generations as, as your individuality kind of falls apart in that cosmology and it's it's almost inconceivable to tr- 
transmit that understanding and that that the necessity to decolonize it to a colonized, in this case, politician, mm. to actually say, no, this is actually not about simple crimes against particular people in history. This is not the point. It might look like the point, as you say, from a legal perspective, but it's, it is far, far bigger than that. And actually, to try and comprehend that, that this, this, um, the moment that is being lived right now, say, say for sorry business to happen, this moment that is being lived, in that moment, there is a um, mingling of the waters between the ancestors of the colonised and the ancestors of those people who have suffered genocides in Australia. And yet, the mingling of those waters erases the distinctness of those crimes. Now, if you don't have a sense of ancestry as being important and as ancestry as being in the now or the, the creation time or dreaming being now as well as the lives of all those who have gone before you in blood and in spirit, then how do you even get close to that in any sort of meaningful sense? How do you even get close to that? And Australia, as you said, my... I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I don't know what to do with Australia. Yeah. Other than try and try really hard to to push into perhaps education for those new ones that are coming in a, a different way of thinking about this because because ancestry is not family. It is bigger than that. Ancestry is not your genealogy on ancestry. <laughs> And that's a, that, that, that's an inconceivable thing to, to say that sitting with this, sitting with this together, requires being present to it, firstly, and to ask a, a, colon, a, a strongly colonised and very fearful person, like uh, like a politician that you mentioned, to actually to actually come emotionally to the party to sit with it. To to then participate, it's yeah. Yeah, I mean, we just we just out we we outgrow them. They're on the way out. I like my fifteen year gap from Australia was very useful in 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 seeing the difference. So you have, um, yeah. It's just that it's we are coming from very far behind and have uh, have a long way to go. And as you point out, it will definitely not be in in our lifetimes. But uh, it's it's been more positive. Feeling and and seeing that the that the trajectory has changed. We're not anywhere near where we need to be, but um, I, I we win in the end, Amber. Put it that way. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. I do. I guess I guess Australia is always is sticking in my throat a little bit because oh, we've look. been here in New Zealand. We are very close, and I have spent quite a bit of time there as well. It's there is something cosmic about. Um, sort of like, as I said, the worst manifestation of empire hitting the um, oldest continually practiced cultures on earth. There is something cosmic, and again, I don't want to whitewash the crimes, but it just seems very interesting to me that uh, it's a particular battlefront um, that is part of, like if it, it, and they will, um, I have this kind of theory. So Aboriginal cultures have existed for 50,000 years or more. They've seen off ice ages. So the the colonialisming, so um, actual experience of colonialism is 200 and change years old. In in terms of the time scales of, of Aboriginal cultures, it's a car crash where their head hasn't hit the windscreen yet. It's a really bad car crash. But let me assure you, they've seen off ice ages and uh, they're 25 times the length. They've been around for 25 times Western civilization has. And if you ask anyone, if you think Western civilization will have not destroyed itself <laughs> between now and 48,000 years in time, there's a tortoise and the hare thing where we win and, and I'm pretty sure they win. Um, so mm. fingers crossed. Mm. Yeah, that's very good. And 
better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, newly minted Dr. Seppi, again, congratulations on uh, on getting the hat <laughs> and, and completing the thesis, um, which I will – I'll have the article um, linked below, uh, More Than Stories, More Than Myths, which has a lot of the information we've been talking about. But if people want to know more uh, about yourself, is there anywhere they can go or, um, you know, websites – that sort of thing, or should we leave it with the uh, should we leave it with the article and you remain mysterious? Oh no, no. Um, I can be emailed. I don't have a website. Cool, um, but I can be emailed, and um, I'm also on Facebook and happy to. That's sort of an academic place for me to talk with people as well. Great. Um, but I don't have anything other than that going on. I, I'm certainly not mysterious. I'm just perhaps perhaps. A little um, behind the times. <laughs> no, we just yeah, we had we had some Mercury retrograde challenges lining up the uh, yeah lining up the discussion. So that was a little private joke, which maybe I shouldn't have said because literally no one else will get it. Uh, but I cool. get it. Yeah, you I did. Get it. I was an astrologer <laughs> years ago. I get it. Um, so you and I, are, you and I are on it. Always welcome. I mean, contact is always welcome if if anyone wants to talk about um, what I'm doing, what they're doing, um, what we're all doing. Uh, the door is open. So Wonderful. I, uh, well, I'd right. love to hear from anyone who's interested. Well, details in the show notes. And uh, and once again, congratulations and, and thank you very, very much for your time. It has been a delightful conversation and I hope it won't be our last. It won't be. I am sure of this. Thank you so much, Gordon. It's really good to talk to you. Well, I very obviously enjoyed that. And for premium members embarking on the Magical Geography course, hopefully this discussion with Dr. Seppi hymns along with the recently released module on belonging. For those who wish to know more, you can find a link to Amber's article, More Than Stories, More Than Myths, in the show notes. It's an excellent exploration for how we can best think with other than Western life ways so that they don't crumble into rust and little pieces when we surface them from the shipwreck. So check that out if you're keen. If you're keen for more talky talk, subscribe to the show on Spotify, YouTube, or in your favorite podcatcher. Find out more at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page. And find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>